And uh, we, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We will come to you right away. Let's get Steve. Steve's been so eager here down the front. We'll uh, do Steve first. Hang on a sec. We'll just get, we'll get the mic. Someone else is going to use that mic. No, you hold on to that. You hold on to it. The mic's coming. There we go. All right. This is a question for Linda, but anybody who stands on the stage that has an opinion about my question, I'd be interested to hear it. Cannabis oil. Yes. Not for the side effects. I know you're already rolling your eyes, but... No, no, I'm not rolling my eyes. Okay. No, I, just, I get it so much. Okay. <laughs> not for the side effects, yeah. but for the cure. Yes. I've been taking it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got my license, just so you all know. <laughs> I've been taking it, and Dr. Kapoor, his attitude was great. He said... If there are clinical trials, I haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. But if it'll make you feel better, maybe it's placebic, so do it. Yep. And so I have been. And um, I, I might be cancer-free, I don't know. But we'll find out after the result of the, the cyber knife. But yeah. it's, it's, I believe it's been doing me some good, although I don't, there are no clinical trials. What's your opinion, please? So um, there's been some really interesting research looking at the different cannabinoids as well as THC and its role not only in managing symptoms of cancer treatment but also as a cancer treatment itself. Most of the research has really been hampered on whole plant um, research on marijuana uh, because of the legal status of it in North America as well as in Europe. Um, there's one trial going on right now that has been sponsored by the pharmaceutical company that creates Sativex, which is uh, a derivative of the THC. Uh, the focus though is on uh, brain tumors, so glioblastoma. Uh, that's coming from work in Spain by uh, Guzman, who's uh, looked at injecting THC into glio uh, glioma uh, tumors and has seen a reduction in uh, in the growth of the tumors as a consequence. And so there has been some really interesting bench research that's looked at the various components of, of cannabis. We just don't have the clinical trials right now to know. So as long as you're aware of the potential side effects of cannabis, you know, beyond the psychoactive high, there's other side effects attached to it. Um, it sounds like you're doing it through a legal route and now federally it is a legal substance. Um, and if you also know the risks in terms of coordination with driving and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's on the cusp of, of getting evidence for us mm -hmm. to know one way or the other. Uh, and we need to expand it beyond uh, glioblastoma. We need to be looking at other types of cancers as well. Um, I'm going to jump in here because uh, the other issue that I've heard around it, it, it helps nausea and, uh, and also can increase appetite. Any, any comments on that? Most of the research has been done on the pharmaceutical forms of cannabis, not the, the cannabis oil, but yes, there has been an indication that it helps people that uh, aren't being treated by the regular uh, drugs, that are struggling with, like you say, intractable kind of nausea and vomiting. It can help people. I've seen it clinically help people with intractable hiccups after bone marrow transplant. I've also seen people, they, some people feel it helps their anxiety, but some people also have a rebound and have heightened anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's really working with a good practitioner that's open to talking about your journey with cannabis and the side effects. Um, but we're, we're starting to get more and more research as it becomes um, legal in, in a variety of states as well as in Canada. And that's our biggest block, is it? Well, in terms of having research on the whole plant, we, we're, we see a lot of research on Sedevex and other pharmaceutical grades, but most patients are wanting to use it because of the self-titration through either smoking it or vaporizing it or through the, the oil. Um, so we need to have a lot more studies to understand the safety when you're using the whole plant. Now, there's something we wouldn't have talked about seven years ago. Let's go <laughs> that there. Um, my question is for uh, Danielle. Um, I'm just wondering, I always thought palliative care was end of life more when, um, but if it, as you said, it doesn't have to be, it could be at any point. Uh, how, how do you access that kind of care? Um, I'm only familiar with it through someone in hospital who, you know, we had to make a decision and so palliative care was called in at that point and that was end of life. Mm -hmm. And I would say that your experience is not an uncommon one and that's what I'm hoping we can change. You know, you know something. We've gotten results back, and it doesn't look good. And so now, let's call the palliative care team in when you're not familiar with them. You're already in a stressful situation, and now they're going to have difficult conversations with you. It's not the best time, right? So, if you wanted to be linked with a palliative care professional, whether it's a social worker or a physician or a nurse practitioner, you can ask your oncologist. A lot of the big cancer centers, whether it's Sunnybrook or uh, Princess Margaret, 
they have palliative care professionals that work out of a clinic, right? So just like you would go to your oncologist to see them for regular checkups, you can book appointments with palliative care professionals as well. And for a lot of people, it is based around symptom management while they're going through treatment. And then, you know, as things may, may or may not, not change with your, your diagnosis, then they can have more of the conversations about quality of life and how can we help you to live the best life possible. So I would say that's probably one of the first places to, to look. If you're wondering about more community-based supports, sometimes if you have CCAC or home care involved in your care, your loved one's care, that could be another place to ask, asking your case manager. You can also look to hospices. I know we've been saying we don't like Google, but Googling a hospice in your area is okay. <laughs> They're community professionals. They, they are... They're really good at mobilizing resources and talking about what palliative care is and isn't, helping you to know which resources to access, uh, and hospices don't charge. So, so that's a good thing as well. Can we talk a bit, just a little bit about if you, uh, is there a psychological block about asking about palliative care because is that then uh, denial issues or uh, then acknowledging maybe you're going to die, that, that you could have to climb over that psychological barrier. If I ask for palliative care, then I'm kind of acknowledging that's it. Uh, absolutely. So a lot of the times if I go in to speak to somebody and they, hear, and they tell me palliative care was called to see me, the doctor's not telling me something, something's going on, right? Uh, and for them... They're going to, to that place of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get better. People are giving up hope or they're going to take away treatment from me. So it is a huge psychological hurdle to get over. And just speaking with people about, you know, by talking about it doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? Uh, by worrying that a scan might be bad doesn't mean that your scan's going to come back negatively. So unless we talk about it and talk about what our fears are around it, we're never going to get past that point. And... I think that when our keynote speaker was talking about fear, you know, you can either run with it or run away from it. A lot of the times I would tell people that you've got to mobilize that fear, that anxiety that you've got and use it for something good and use it to get answers, right? Not just staying in that frightened place and, and not talking about it and not getting any help or any farther along. We have a question over here. Um, I have a question about the role with alternative therapy and drug stores. So somebody at my cancer uh, support group had said, I tried this and it works. So I went to the drug store. They have it. Not only do they have it, they have the drug store's own brand. They didn't know anything about it. So I tried another drug store. He said, may work, may not. I don't know. Um, so is it like, should I avoid a drug store picking up a product that by word of mouth I've um, found out from someone else is good? And how do I know what brand to buy, or should I just go to an alternative therapy professional? Thank so, you. Thanks. So pharmacists are often great resources about natural health products because they often have access to some of the databases that I mentioned, and we're seeing more and more pharmacists are trained in natural health products. In terms of you taking um, the advice of your, of your peer um, about using a therapy, I guess the question would be, do you have the same goal in mind as that individual in terms of using that therapy? And are you also aware of the potential side effects of that therapy? And could it interact with maybe different medications that you're on? So um, I think it'd be really useful to kind of have that dialogue with somebody, if maybe your family physician, maybe a pharmacist, before you use it. In terms of using specific brands of natural health products, um, all natural health products that are sold in Canada are regulated through Health Canada. So what they say on the bottle should be in the actual bottle, and you don't have to worry about contamination. I know talking to CAM practitioners, they often believe that some brands are better than others. Uh, we really don't have any research to suggest that there's differences in terms of the different types that you use for using a generic one or using one that's brand name. But perhaps consulting a, a CAM practitioner that's knowledgeable about some of those natural health products might help you in also uh, making that decision. And by the way, we will put all the links up on the Kidney Cancer Canada website so uh, you can have that information. Uh, I'll get to you. Just want, just want to get Karen involved in here. Karen, you mentioned uh, during your speech about the uh, issue you had with your GP. How difficult was that for you? Because I, I, 
to be honest with you, in every single time we do these forums, somebody comes up and has a very, very similar story uh, to you, and and uh, it, it's it's infuriating, really, to hear it. It, it was it was. Can you awful. hold the mic up a little bit more? It was it was awful. It was upsetting to me and a family friend, so upsetting to my family, and uh, you know, I made a decision as soon as I heard his words that, you know, this is not going to work for us long term. So I found another doctor, but you know, it's it's still leaves a bad taste in your mouth, right? Yeah. And once did in a you, while, did you feel you were wrong? I felt uh, blamed, and I felt kind of guilty at the time that I've done something wrong. Yeah, for sure, in the moment. But then, as I thought of it later, and then once the results came back, I thought, "Wow, I'm so glad we didn't wait." I don't know. I didn't have any idea how fast this tumor was growing, and you know, there were so many unanswered questions that you know I, I felt like I was in the right to advocate for myself and it was helpful because I I talked with others I contacted um, Kidney Cancer Canada and I was advised to you know if it's something you feel strongly about advocate for yourself in this and, and yeah I'm okay about it now but it was tough going through that thanks Karen thank you for that sir uh, this is this is for Danielle uh, I'm a patient at Sunnybrook um, and I was having some pain issues and my doctor suggested I go to the pain clinic and he gave me the extension number, and I called, and they answered palliative care. Well, obviously, I had the wrong number, <laughs> so I hung up. <laughs> Cancer patients don't want to hear palliative care. Found out it was the right extension, mm -hmm. made the appointment, went in and saw the doctor. He was very nice. We had a long conversation, and I suggested to him, perhaps trying to teach everybody what palliative care is, maybe just tweak the name a little bit. <laughs> maybe palliative and pain care so that doesn't freak people out because I was freaked. Yeah, and, and that's a very common experience, right? And I think a lot of the times uh, if an oncologist is referring you to, to palliative care, they might just say, we're getting the pain people involved because they know, they know that strong reaction, right? Exactly. So even as professionals, we shy away from it because we know what everybody's thinking in the back of their head. Oh, the doctor's not telling me something. Oh, they're giving up and, and, and they're going to be taking care away from me. Not the case. And it sounds like from your experience, it was for a specific reason for, for pain management. And it sounds like mm -hmm. your concerns were addressed and, and you didn't fall over. You didn't have too much of a panic. You're still here, right? So, <laughs> I, I just reviewed a research article where they're looking at changing the name of palliative care and they actually, they did a research study to look at different types of names and whether it would improve access to care. So we are aware of that as That's being important. an issue. You know, it's interesting. But, uh, and then let's continue. So just, just along those lines, um, the, the, the CCO has already changed the name across the province from palliative care to symptom control team. So it's already happened in our hospital as well as Dr. Pfeiffer's hospital. It's called the symptom control team as opposed to palliative care. So that, that, that name has already changed in, in the uh, cancer centers. That's great. And as well, to adjust the things that we've already talked about is that there's a move on by the government uh, across the country to, to get palliative care or symptom control team involved earlier in the disease. And it's uh, actually a move on that all cancer patients that are seen at the cancer center should also get a symptom control team uh, uh, referral. So that's already on the move. The, the issue is resources. It's hard. There's only one or two palliative care doctors at each hospital, and they're already being called symptom control doctors. Um, and so they're kind of overwhelmed. But what happens at most cancer centers is that if you come to see us and you're from uh, Niagara Falls, you'll get referred to the um, symptom control doctor or the palliative care doctor in that region al already. So it's all these all these things are already in place. They just have to. Um, um, it just has to happen from your oncologist to refer, because right now that's where we're trying to move to, but they're limited by resources. Thank you. You know, uh, the other thing, when I was diagnosed, we got one more question back there, is that uh, I got a very quick reference to the uh, social work team. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the palliative care, but to sit down and start talking about the process of what was going through. And uh, I actually thought I was depressed and then realized I was grieving. So it, it, I found that um, the uh, discussion with the social work team was huge. And, and what was really good was for other family members and friends to go in and, and go through that. Because uh, once you realize you're not alone in this and the feelings you have are completely normal that everyone goes through, it, it really it helps you get over that hurdle. Let's go back uh, to the back of the room. 
Yeah, uh, just a quick uh, quick comment for the uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, to Karen, I just want to tell the room that um, it's your strength of character, it has nothing to do with me, but it's the strength of character and your persistence that contributes to your survivorship. So I wish you congratulations, and you're certainly a wonderful patient. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the, uh, no question. And uh, just uh, for uh, Linda, I tried a quick, uh, quick thing. Um, you s the last thing you said was that um, in Canada things are regulated, you know, in terms of complementary uh, products in, that you find at health food stores or the or the pharmacy. And I don't uh, like to refer to my own research often, but I'm going to indulge myself just this once. Um, in uh, the first paper I ever wrote in the medical literature, I went as a medical student to about a dozen pharmacies across the GTA, everywhere from Oakville to, you know, to, to Ajax and so on, and uh, sent these, uh, these, this was a prostate-centered project, and I sent all of these complementary alternative medicine, you know, lycopene, selenium, salt palmetto, all the things that people spend a lot of money on for prostate cancer, uh, prevention and treatment, and we sent it off to an independent lab on Hamilton, we had an NMR spec, we had to know exactly what was in these products, and lo and behold, you know, out of this, out of this, we found out that none of the products had active ingredients in these things. These are real brands, real things that, that people buy and spend their hard-earned money on every day. Now, so, and we published this in the Journal of Urology. Um, the, you know, and we since actually last year duplicated this study to see if there was any difference in from 2002 to now, and in fact, there's the same results. So that, that paper is gonna come out soon. Um, so. You know, I first of all, I'd like to congratulate you because that was the most wonderful talk about complementary alternative medicine, alternative medicine that I've personally heard. It was great because it was right on point. I think there absolutely is a place, but it has to be an evidence-based place, and I think that's really what your message was. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to challenge everybody who who is an advocate for complementary alternative medicine, uh, who who I think because I certainly believe that there's a place in in the spectrum, um, you know, alongside with the conventional medicine, to speak to their MPPs, speak to uh, regulation agencies, and so on, to get some of these companies who are literally putting nothing in them to actually do what they're supposed to do. And these are not DIN-related products. These are not, this is the, the, the more unregulated side. So that, for me, is a, you know, is a, is a painful thing to see for, for patients because everybody's you know, paying a lot of money for that and putting their faith in that. But you know, there has to be something. I wanted to know what your thoughts are on that and whether or not we as providers or patients or caregivers or whoever's in the room can actually positively impact that. I definitely think um, the natural and non-prescription health product directorate isn't perfect, but it's one of the few, uh, we're one of the few countries in the world that have actually tried to take a step forward in terms of actually reviewing what is on Canadian shelves. We have no control of what's brought in through the internet, and we have no control of what people bring in from out of country. Um, and uh, there's been several you know, media reports that have suggested that it's not a perfect system. Uh, we're one of the few regulatory systems that allow traditional evidence, which is very controversial um, because it's not based on empirical research studies. Um, in terms of the quality, I think you know, some of those reports have really showed that there's people that are falling through the cracks, that uh, we don't have an active regulation system in this country for natural health products. We're not actually going out and testing the products like your team did to say, is it actually controlled, is it actually containing the active ingredient. We have some passive uh, research studies going on called the SONAR study through the University of Alberta that's looking for negative effects. Uh, we can report negative effects through the MedEffex program of Health Canada. But if we are truly concerned about uh, the quality of these products, then we need more active surveillance. And so I agree with you. We need to be challenging our governments, federally as well as provincially, to say how are we regulating not only natural health products but also health professionals. And how can we ensure that good quality care is being provided to Canadians? And I think the only way that will happen is if we put pressure on our government to put money and resources behind it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's hear it for our panel, everybody.